This morning's scripture reading is from Mark, <clears throat> chapter 1, verses 40 through 45. Jesus heals a man with leprosy. A man with leprosy came to him, and he begged him on his knees, If you are willing, you can make me clean. Filled with compassion, Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said. Be clean. Immediately the leprosy left him and he was cured. Jesus sent him away at once with a strong warning. See to it that you don't tell, anyone, any, tell this to anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Instead, he went out and began to talk freely, spreading the news. And as a result, Jesus could no longer enter a town openly, but stayed outside in lonely places. Yet the people still came to him from everywhere. This is the word of the Lord. In recent weeks, we've all seen how Hurricane Harvey and Hurricane Irma have devastated the South. And it reminded me of a time not too long ago when Katrina and Rita did the same thing. When I was working in a church in Newton, it was my privilege to lead a group of people down to do some hurricane uh, work in, in Louisiana, in New Orleans. And it just so happened in order to get ourselves there, we had to fly on a Saturday. We went to church on Sunday morning and our work wasn't going to begin until Monday. So we had an opportunity to explore the city. And so I went to the New Orleans Aquarium with a few folks who were interested in, in seeing the place. You know, it was a really beautiful aquarium. And if you ever have had a chance to get down there, I really would highly recommend visiting it. Um, they have these great hands-on exhibits for children. And I just happened to be with some younger folks who were curious. And so in the center of this very large space is a shallow tank. And it's filled with small stingrays. And the instructions on the wall invited you to just put your hand in in order to pet the stingrays. And I thought that was kind of strange, but I put my hand in the water and just kind of waited for a few seconds. And sure enough, one of them came up and touched my hand. And then another, and another, and another. And to me, it was fascinating how these amazing little sea creatures seemed to want to be touched. And they reminded me a lot of my dog. I have this dog, her name is Abby, and she's very sweet. But she's constantly in need of attention and especially likes to be touched. And as a matter of fact, if you put your hand on her head, as she's sitting next to you, she will not move. She just won't. She'll just stay there as long as you keep a part of your body touching her. She loves to be touched. And I think it's true that all of us indeed like to be touched. We crave touch. We desire that connectedness that we feel when, when we have a handshake or a hug. And we want the gentle reassurance that comes when someone puts their hand on our shoulder and tells us that things are going to be all right. Touch is healing and restorative. It's important. And there are many studies that show and confirm this. Listen to what some experts wrote. Touching eases pain, lessens anxiety, softens the blows of life, generates hope, and has the power to heal, according to most experts. In fact, modern psychology and medicine are confirming what mothers across the centuries have intuitively known, namely that there is healing power in touch. Various studies and experiments show the simple act of reaching out and touching another person frequently results in physical benefits such as the slowing of your heart rate, the dropping of your blood pressure, and the speedy recovery from illness. Interesting, right? If the passage that we just read this morning has the healing power of touch at its core. And the central figure in this is a man that Jesus encounters who is stricken with leprosy. In the account that we just read, he's described as a man who's full of leprosy. So we know that this, this condition of his has progressed for quite a long time. And it's likely that this man would have, would, have, um, would have not have had actually what we know to be leprosy. It was probably one of six or seven disfiguring and contagious diseases uh, that really were just kind of lumped together in this category of leprosy. But whatever the true diagnosis was, he was treated and regarded as though he was a leper and forced to live according to instructions that were put out in Leviticus a long time ago. Leviticus 13, 45-46 says this, 
The person with such an infectious disease must wear torn clothes, let his hair be unkempt, cover the lower part of his face, and cry out, unclean, unclean. As long as he has the infection, he remains unclean, and he must live alone. He must live outside the camp. For generations, it was the practice of the Jewish society to expel people with leprosy from community. They were in every sense of the word outcast and treated as such. And there was a certain loathing that was directed toward lepers. It wasn't merely because of the fear of the horrible and contagious disease that it was. There was more to it. There was actually judgment attached to leprosy. Leprosy also made a person uh, ritually unclean. And to touch a leper defiled a Jew almost in much the same way as touching a dead body did. It was also seen as a sign of God's disfavor. Many believed that leprosy was his punishment for some sinful behavior. And while we might find this hard, to, hard notion to accept, in Jesus' day it would have been a common understanding. Perhaps this was because of what had happened to King Uzziah. Do you remember King Uzziah's story? 2 Kings 15 tells us that King Uzziah was stricken with leprosy for illegitimately seeking to assume the role of a priest. God gave him this disease as a punishment for his sinful actions because he had overstepped his boundaries as king. And as we read in the account of his life, it says at the end, the Lord afflicted the king with leprosy until the day he died, and he lived in a separate house. Jotham, the king's son, had charge of the palace and governed the people of the land. So it wasn't an uncommon thing for people to believe that leprosy was a punishment from God. So imagine this man covered with painful sores, ostracized, lonely and judged by others. He stands outside the wall of the town looking in and he sees a large crowd gathering in a courtyard, perhaps in front of a synagogue, and how he longs to be able to join them. He realizes that the man addressing them is Jesus. Now we don't know why or how, but this man knew of Jesus' reputation as a healer. And desperate as he was, he enters the courtyard and approaches Jesus. He knew that this was risky. People would come and stone him for taking such an action. And he, was, he would walk along as he shouted those dehumanizing and, un, and humiliating words, unclean, unclean, while probably ringing some kind of bell to draw attention to himself. And as they saw him coming through the crowd, they probably began to scurry out of his way. Many probably looked repulsed at the sight of this sick and disfigured man. Others likely glared at him. Who was he, after all, to approach someone so important, this person of great reputation and notoriety as Jesus? He was a filthy, smelly leper, a no one, a sinner. And as the man fell on his face before Jesus, you can just picture what this looked like. Painful and hard as it was, slowly and painfully, down onto his knees, he lowered himself. He put his face to the ground, probably inches from Jesus' feet, in a position of complete humility and submission. And he says, without looking up, without making any eye contact at all, he says, If you're willing, you can make me clean. Check out Jesus' response. The passage tells us that Jesus was moved with compassion for this man. And with all of these horrified people looking on, he begins to descend in the direction of this poor guy. He bends toward him and reaches out his hand. Can you picture Jesus getting close enough to whisper to him in his ear? And just as his hand came to rest on the man's shoulders, he whispers, I am willing. I'm absolutely willing. Be clean. And as he touched this man, I imagine that two things happened simultaneously. First, the many onlookers began to gasp. They were likely appalled and disgusted. I can imagine weak-kneed men and women fainting at the sight of this teacher, this respected man, purposefully defiling himself by touching this outcast, this sinner, this disease-ridden lowlife. Then there were the others in the crowd who became filled with disgust and with anger. They felt betrayed by this man who passed himself off as so learned about the law, but clearly showed himself to be some kind of an imposter. And to think that they had wasted their time on this Jesus character, Jesus' compassion stirs the crowd, and they were most likely horrified. 
Secondly, this man was cleansed. Cleansed physically from the awful disease that had plagued him for heaven knows how long. No longer in pain, restored in body in an instant. And perhaps more importantly, restored in spirit as well, when he felt for the very first time in a while the healing touch of another. His dignity, his sense of self, restored by a simple gesture of kindness long forgotten. You know, I've read a lot of devotionals on this passage and heard sermons on where people point out how kind and gentle and compassionate Jesus was based on the decision that he decided to touch this leper. But I have to say that I see this passage rather differently. I believe that this act of touching the leper shows Jesus to be bold, courageous character who didn't care what others thought of him. Strong in his sense of self, led by his convictions to do the right thing, Jesus acts willingly and from a place of true compassion. Think about it. Jesus was in a public square of some kind, teaching and ministering to people that were gathered there. He's sharing about God's word, about the kingdom of heaven, about what the Father has in store for them. And presumably, just as, just as it was wherever Jesus spoke, people were hanging on his every word. For we read over and over again about how many people were amazed at his teaching. They were finding him to be this powerful leader and teacher, convincing and convicting. Things were going well for Jesus. He had the crowd right where he wanted them, engaged in listening. And then all of a sudden comes this leper, this outcast, this person who elicited from all those in the crowd disdain and repulsion. And they must have been incensed, incensed that this man would have had the audacity to approach this good teacher, the man of God, and get so near to him. They were most likely offended and waited expectantly for Jesus to shun this man, to rebuke him for not following the instructions from Leviticus. So if you're Jesus, what do you do? Now maybe I'm a cynic, but I suspect that there was tension in that moment for Jesus. On the one hand, he had a message to give to many people gathered, in the, gathered there in the courtyard. And in the other, and in order to be heard, he needed to be respected, well thought of, credible in their eyes, right? So to engage this leper could jeopardize all the work that he had done that day. And after all, didn't Levitical law dictate by his Father in heaven call for this man to be put out of the city and treated as defiled? This would have been what was expected and acceptable action for the day. But on the other hand, there's this lonely, pathetic, long-suffering man who comes taking an enormous risk, acting in faith, a person hoping for relief, looking for a new lease on life. What to do? Mark tells us that Jesus was moved with compassion. Literally, that he had this gut reaction toward this man's need. And he said, I am willing. Thalo is the Greek for that. And it can be translated in this way, to have a natural impulse or desire without regard for any deliberation or consideration. Let's read that again. To have a natural impulse or desire without regard for any deliberation or consideration. I love that definition of willingness. It's so powerful. It's this willingness that's selfless and it's pure. It has no bounds and it doesn't overthink situations. It's informed and empowered by one's soul alone. It is in this three word statement, I am willing, where we get a glimpse into the true heart of Jesus. You see, he didn't need to touch this man. He could have healed him from a distance and sent him on his way. But his willingness, compelled by his compassion, he knew that he had to touch him. Jesus knew touch is powerful and restorative effect, and he simply could not withhold it from this man. His willingness is the essence of who he is as the God incarnate. It compels him to act on behalf of the man's needs and suffering. It's the very same willingness, that same compulsion without regard for his own suffering, that leads him to the cross on our behalf as well. Truth be told, I've seen this kind of bold willingness in a number of people, and sometimes it scares me. There's a remarkable woman that I know, her name is Beth Kidd. She works at a place called the Place of Promise. And Beth works with some of the most damaged people in society. 
people that our society would, con con would absolutely consider to be outcasts. And she's given her life to a ministry with a reckless abandonment that makes me really nervous, to be honest. She doesn't seem to care how much time it takes or how often these people take advantage of her. She walks through fire with these folks. There is nothing safe, logical, convenient, or clearly defined in the life that Beth Kidd lives. There wasn't anything safe or convenient or clearly defined in the life that Jesus lived either. Beth is one of those people who has that bold willingness to love others like Jesus did. Now, I don't know about you, but I feel like I have a long way to go in regard to this. A while ago, I was on my way home. I was pressed for time, and I needed to go to the grocery store to pick up four items that I needed to make dinner that night. And as I stepped out of my car, I heard a trembling voice from behind me. And there was this young woman. She was standing there with her two kids in tow. She said, excuse me, sir, I'm wondering if you have $12 that you could give me. I'm having a really bad day, and I need to get to New Hampshire. Now, normally, you see, I'm the father of three girls, and by definition, do you know what that makes me? An ATM machine. <laughs> and because of that, I almost always have 20 or $40 on cash in me, but on that day, I didn't have any money at all in my pocket. I told this woman to wait for me, that I'd be happy to give her some money. And so I went into the store, and I quickly grabbed my four items, and I got some cash from the, from the, uh, from the cashier, and I went outside, and she was gone. I looked around, I walked through the parking lot, I drove around in a circle, but I didn't see her or her children anywhere. At first I tried to sell, tell myself that it was okay, that she had gotten what she needed and just left. But for weeks, every time I drove by that grocery store, I would feel badly. I realized now that it was my unwillingness to engage this woman as I hurried along, my lack of compassion that was eating at me. I could have stopped and asked the woman what was wrong. I could have taken her into the store with me and gotten her whatever she wanted, money, food, anything. I should have showed her that compassion and treated her with the dignity she deserved, but I didn't. I treated her like an inconvenience, and it's not something I'm proud of. The bottom line, folks, is that our capacity to love others like Jesus does and always will start with a willingness. A bold willingness compelled by love, to do the godly, compassionate thing that you know that you're called to do, to step out without thinking about the consequences or whether it's convenient, without weighing the sacrifices that are being asked of you, without worrying about the risks of rejection or ridicule or loss of reputation or even status, without being afraid to look too closely at the brokenness in someone else's life for the fear of having it cause your heart to break. Jesus was willing to lay down his life for all mankind. To go to great lengths to bring us before the throne of God. And out of his love and compassion for us, he was compelled to take that action. I believe that the goal of a disciple of Christ is to grow in our likeness of him. To be human reflections of the character and incarnation of Christ to others. And the Bible tells us that we love because he first loved us. We forgive because we are forgiven. The love and compassion that we see as God's people, we share with others in the outpouring of love and compassion that we've experienced because of God's forgiveness and because we are redeemed people. May the God of love show you compassion and may he feed you in your willingness to act compassionately toward others. May God grant us the bold willingness to step in, up in faith and to do the right thing and bring him glory in all that we do. Amen.